Hi learners, it's M from Sano Nerds, and this video is on Unit 12B, Resolution Discussion Number 3, where we're going to talk about elevational and lateral resolution. Unit 12B, Resolution Number 3, Elevational and Lateral Resolution. So remember, Unit 12 was divided into Units 12A and 12B. In 12A, we discussed the characteristics of transducers and covered how each of them created an image. Now in Unit 12B, we are going to continue the discussion surrounding resolution. So in this third resolution discussion, we're going to explore what elevational resolution is and how the transducer construction affects it. We're also going to retouch on lateral resolution and some other things that we can do to improve it or degrade it. Section 12B.1, Elevational Resolution. Elevational resolution is the system's ability to create a very thin imaging plane. So when we're imaging, we think about our beam as being just super, super, super thin. But in reality, it actually has some thickness to it. So if we think of our transducer beam kind of like a building on a street, and if we think of our transducer being next to that building, axial resolution then would be walking down the street that comes directly away from the transducer or parallel with the beam. And then lateral resolution would be walking down the street that is side to side or perpendicular to the beam. Elevational resolution then is going to be the amount of floors that the building has or the height of the beam. For ultrasound, a beam with one floor is much more preferred than a beam with 50 floors. So in general, elevation is the Z axis. The thickness of the beam is going to improve or degrade image quality. When the beam is thin, then the reflectors displayed are the most accurate representation of anatomy. When the beam is thick, the reflectors displayed not only represent reflectors in the center of the beam, but we're going to start to see some reflectors from different heights of the beam too. The unwanted reflections are not always going to be super apparent in our images. Sometimes they're just going to blend in as extra noise. However, when you're imaging structures that you expect to be anechoic or without echoes, then you might see some artifact within them. So this is going to often occur because of the thickness of the beam. In this example here, we have a urinary bladder. The urinary bladder on healthy patients is typically filled with anechoic urine. However, we can see that there are some low level grays in this image, and this is due to elevational resolution. What we are getting is the main structure that we're looking for, the urinary bladder, but the beam also has some thickness to it. And because of that, we're actually catching probably some echoes from bowel, either in front of or behind the bladder, and they're being displayed in our picture because the machine can't tell that they're not in the part of the picture that we want, just the bladder part. So elevational resolution grabs echoes from other structures that sit above or below the main part of the beam. Now we can think of elevational resolution as a thickness of the beam, and that is why it's also known as slice thickness resolution. So here's another view, kind of looking at all three resolutions that we've talked about. We've got axial resolution being parallel with the sound beam. So that's represented by the pink arrow here. Lateral resolution is the side to side of the sound beam. Remember that's going to be concurrent with whatever the beam width is. So that's our lateral resolution represented by the blue. And then we've introduced this idea that there is a height or a thickness to the beam. And that's our elevational represented in orange. The slice thickness of a beam is dependent on the transducer. So recall that we've already learned about two transducers that have disc shaped elements, the mechanical transducer and the annular transducer. And we also learned that with single element transducers, the diameter of the crystal will determine the diameter of the beam, be that in the near field, at the focus, or in the far field. So if we took a cross section of a single disc shaped element, we would end up getting a cross section that is circular. And because it is circular, we now know that the beam width is going to be the same as the beam height. So if we're looking at this example here, remember the diameter of our crystal is the diameter of our beam at the beginning of the near zone. It's going to reduce to half the diameter at the focus. So let's say we take a cross section right at this focal point here. Side to side is our lateral resolution. That's going to be the half diameter of the crystal. 
and up and down is our elevational resolution, and it's also half the diameter of the crystal because it is a circular cross section of the beam. So again, elevational thickness is going to be the same as the lateral width. And because of that circular cross section and because of how it narrows at the focus, elements that are disc shape are going to create the best elevational resolution. The only problem is, is that we don't use this type of transducer anymore. Now we need to explore a little bit more than what the array transducers do to our elevational thickness. So starting with 1D element arrays, remember those are multiple elements that are aligned in one single row. That's going to reflect what our modern transducers use, multiple rectangular shaped elements that create the array. And we learned that with this type of transducer, focusing can be achieved in the lateral plane by phasing the electrical pulses into a curved path. So when we curve the path of the beam coming down those wires to the elements, what we end up getting is a focused beam in the lateral resolution direction, in the lateral side to side. So the phasing of the beam is going to make the beam thinner in the side to side plane or in the lateral plane, but it doesn't change the elevational plane. And if you think back to what we talked about with all those transducers, we talked about them having a fixed elevational height. So we can adjust so we can adjust the lateral width, but we could not adjust that elevational height. And that's because 1D element arrays tend to use an acoustic lens to focus the beam in the elevational plane. So that creates a fixed, non-adjustable thickness to the beam. And just like we saw with the single element transducers in the lateral plane, we're gonna see the same thing happen in the elevational plane. The height of the elevational plane is going to match the height of the crystal. It's going to be half the height at the focus, and then it's going to diverge to a very great height in the far field. With that acoustic lens, you're going to have a fixed height at certain points in your elevation as the beam propagates away from the transducer. And because of this acoustic lens creating that fixed thickness, we're going to see that resolutions from best to worst end up being axial as the best, lateral as the second best, and elevational resolution as the worst. So now we need to consider what happens when we introduce a one and a half D element array. Instead of just using one row of elements, manufacturers start to develop transducers that have multiple rows of elements. So if that number of elements across the face of the transducer does not equal the number of elements up the face of the transducer, what we've got is a one and a half D array. So for example, if a transducer contains 300 elements, it might have three rows of 100 each. That's a one and a half D array. Now, contrary to that, if it was 100 by 100, that would be considered a 2D array. So again, anytime you have elements across the transducer face and you don't have the same amount of elements going up, it's considered a one and a half D array. They can take on a multitude of arrangements just as long as it's not a square checkerboard pattern. So when you have those multiple elements along the height of the transducer, phasing can be used just like it is for lateral focusing, but this time to focus elevationally. So we have those curved patterns coming down the element wires, but instead of talking to the elements in a curve from side to side, it's going to talk to the elements in a curve up and down. So now we can control the thickness of the beam, and what we end up getting is a more uniform thickness throughout the propagation of the wave from the transducer, and then we end up having some more options. So as the sonographer adjusts the focal point, the beam is not only going to optimize the voltages to create a focal point where the sonographer has requested, also going to create the curve pattern to optimize the elevational thickness to be thinnest at that focal point as well. So you're going to end up getting the best lateral and the best elevational resolution at the focus that you choose. So anytime that you see one and a half D array transducer, you need to immediately link that in your mind that one and a half D array transducers improve elevational resolution. Section 12B.2, more lateral resolution. So now that we know more about transducers, there are a few new concepts that we can talk about in regards to lateral resolution. First, we're going to talk about how the beam's sound energy affects lateral resolution and how the array transducer can improve lateral resolution at deeper depths. 
So up until this point, we've been discussing a transducer beam that has sound energy moving out of the transducer with a very definitive border. But in reality, sound does escape from the central sound beam. And this sound is known as lobes and comes in two types. The first type is side lobes, and that is going to be produced by the single element transducer. The second type is grading lobes, which are produced by multi-element transducers. So we can see here, single element starts with an S, think side lobes, S and S, single element side lobes. And in that one, we've got the beam coming down and kind of off of the center here is where you'll see those side lobes occur. Compare that then to the multi-element transducer, you're gonna have your beam coming out and what we end up getting is a lot of extra energy called grading lobes right from the top of that beam right next to the transducer. So single element side lobes are a little bit deeper off of the beam. Multi-element grading lobes are going to be much closer to the transducer surface. Regardless of what lobes that we're talking about, both types are going to degrade lateral resolution. And that is because when these lobes are present, they're typically strong enough that they are going to interact with tissue. So even though this is our central beam coming down, we're gonna get echoes from anatomy that are in this main path we're also going to get some echoes that come off of these grading lobes or side lobes as well. And so because of that, that ends up degrading our lateral resolution because now we've essentially made the beam wider. So side lobes are just kind of inherent to the single element transducer. However, because we are using multi-element transducers in most of our modern ultrasound systems, we have actually figured out a couple of ways that we can reduce those grading lobes. And that is going to be achieved either through apodization or subdicing. When we were discussing those voltages coming down the wires, we kind of looked at it as all of the elements receiving the same voltage across the face of the transducer. And when we do that, that means that the middle element is going to produce a sound just as strong as the outer elements. And when you have strong sound energy coming out of your outer elements, you are more likely to produce those grading loads. So again, this element and the middle element are going to be receiving the same voltage. If that's the case, we're gonna end up with some extra sound energy coming off of the sides here that don't end up focusing into the main center of the beam. So apodization is used then to correct for this. Apodization is going to use a very strong center voltage and then weakening voltages as we get to the outside. So now this element is gonna be activated by a weak voltage it's going to create a weaker sound beam. And because there's weaker energy in these outside elements, they're not as likely to produce those grading lobes. And if they did, chances are they aren't strong enough to produce any meaningful echoes. So apodization is the strong center voltage. So we get a very strong center sound beam. And we're going to weaken as we move to the outside. So we reduce our chances of those grading lobes appearing. The other technique to reduce grading lobes is called subdicing. And subdicing is going to break elements into what we call sub-elements. And those sub-elements are all going to work together as one element. So if this is the face of our transducer, all single elements, subdicing is going to take those single elements and break them into however many pieces are necessary so that the wavelets created from each of these sound sources interact in a better way, thus reducing the grading lobes. It's important to note that we have 12 elements in this image here. That means there's 12 wires connecting to these elements. When we subdice them, it is not 36 wires, but still 12 wires because all of these elements within the subdiced element are still gonna act as one element. So they are electrically connected to that one wire to still work as one element but because of the way that they are cut up, we get a different interaction of the sound waves that they produce. Another concept that we learned with the single element transducers is that the focal depth is deeper when the diameter is wider. However, when we're using multiple elements, the machine can control how many elements it wants to make a beam with and how many elements to listen for echoes with. The fact that the machine can change the aperture of the transducer means that it is a dynamic aperture. So dynamic means changing, aperture means like the listening hole or the transmitting hole. 
That means that we have a changeable hole in which we can create the beam and listen for echoes with. And with our knowledge about beam diameter, we know that fewer elements are going to improve the lateral resolution in the near field if we are imaging shallow, and more elements are going to improve lateral resolution in the far field. So the machine can look at the maximum depth that we are using and adjust how many elements it's using to optimize the lateral resolution by using fewer or more elements to produce the beam. And that is it for this third discussion of resolution. There's one quick activity in your workbook and then just a few open-ended questions in the nerd check. But this in general is a very brief concept. This is just talking about the third dimension of our sound beam. And we're actually going to talk about it a little bit more when we get into some artifacts as those gradient lobes, side lobes, and elevational resolution do cause artifacts. So we'll revisit some of this, but it is important to talk about them now that we know how transducers are constructed and how each of those transducers make their beam and then talk about how that affects the resolution of our image.